why do most workplaces still lack emotional intelligence and how can we fix that? This is the Leaders of Transformation podcast. And on this show, we interview difference makers and world changers who are disrupting for good. Our guest today is Joshua Freeman. And I'm really excited to have him here because this topic of emotional intelligence is so, so important. And he is one of the world's top experts as it relates to using emotional intelligence to improve performance. He is the co-founder and CEO of Six Seconds, the global nonprofit that is dedicated to teaching people how to use emotional intelligence. He also owns the EQ Network Group on LinkedIn with over 135,000 active members and is a master certified coach. He's written five books on emotional intelligence and has hundreds of have worked, has worked with hundreds of organizations to help them use emotional intelligence to get better results. And so today we're going to talk about why emotional intelligence is the top differentiator for workplace performance. We're going to talk about what most businesses get wrong and how to fix it and the generational EQ differences and how they impact business performance. So we've got lots that we're going to talk about here today, and I'm just looking forward to getting into it. Joshua, welcome to Lead as a Transformation. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. It is a pleasure. Thank you. So let's talk about leaders. What's going on with leaders and why are there still, I know we, you and I talked about this when we were talking on our pre-chat, why are there still so many messed up workplaces if there's that many leadership consultants and advisors, coaches like myself out there, but there's still so much of a gap, what's going on? Uh, it's a fascinating question. I mean, I sometimes wonder, we've been doing this work for 25 years at Six Seconds. We work with organizations all over the world and I still hear, wait, why haven't I heard of you? And like, uh, there's a lot to do out there. Um, I think that in so many organizations, uh, there's this element of just kind of getting through the day and working in the business, but not really working on the business. Mm -hmm. The other main issue uh, is, I think, I'm sure you've had this too, Nicola. I have a lot of uh, senior leaders, even at a very senior le level, say to me, well, this isn't who I really want to be as a leader, but this is how I'm supposed to show up. I'm like, well, tell me, tell me about supposed to. Like, well, you know, it's just the norm. Like, okay, well, did they hire you to just follow the norm or did they hire you to create some change? And I think that disrupting, I mean, really the topic of your show Disrupting the norm is an incredibly challenging and vulnerable thing to do. And even when we go into a workplace and we say, you know, this isn't really working that well, but like, am I, when they say they wanted me to make some change here, did they really mean it? And you know, how often does a new person come into an organization and, uh, you know, and say like, well, maybe we should blah, 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 blah. And people say, well, that's not how we do things here. Well, mm, I remember this happening to me with the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, we were doing a course on change and got through this program working on how do you create change and what are the emotional drivers of change. And this very senior officer stood up and said, you know, well, this isn't, this isn't how we do things here. <laughs> and I did not have the wherewithal at the moment to think, to say, uh, I, I know that, sir. That's why you're in a course on change. <laughs> but, but that's, you know, like stepping out of the, the pattern, stepping out of the, the norm is a risk. And our brains don't really like that. And we can talk a little more about the neuroscience of that pattern and change uh, if you'd like to do that, because it, it kind of illuminates some of what the barriers are. Yeah, I would love to do that because I think that's where, and we've seen that over the last few years, how people have been disrupted and change. They've been like literally freaking out, you know, on so many different levels um, because it's this, I don't want, this isn't the way it's done. This isn't just like what you said about, you know, about that example. It's like, this isn't the way it's supposed to be. And I think mm -hmm. we get stuck in that frame of this is what is supposed to be and 
or what is accepted, that norm. And how do we get out of that? How do we not keep repeating the same old, same old? Because people, you know, have already acknowledged the fact that they don't like it that way. One of my books is called Inside Change. And I'll save you the 25 bucks and just tell you the point of inside change is change starts on the inside. And if you want your organization to be different, that's totally doable. You change the way you engage. You know, you want your salespeople to be more proactive, no problem. You have to be more proactive. You change the way you engage with the people around you, and that will change how they engage with, with others. Uh, but the message of the book, if we go further inside and we look at how does change happen in the brain, and we see that our brain is a pattern following machine. And it's, uh, we build these little automation subroutines and we follow them because they're efficient. And our brains are constantly starved for energy. We, we can't, just cannot process everything in the day. And so we, we automate stuff and the brain is a great servant and it just says, okay, I'll take care of that. You don't have to think about it again. It's comfortable for us to be uh, follow what's known. It's comfortable for us to do what we've done before. And that autopilot works really well when you're flying someplace known. You know, I want to go to Topeka. If there's a storm, I'm going to flip on my autopilot. My plane's going to get more or less to Topeka by itself. And I used to, I used to think like, well, you know, if there's like a storm, we should switch it off. But I actually had somebody from the FAA in one of my, uh, in one of my classes said, no, that's when you really need it on because the, the autopilot will know better than the human. But it only works if you're flying someplace known. Right. And if you're trying to go on a route that has been gone on a hundred times before, a thousand times before, the autopilot's perfect. The problem is, most of us are trying to go places we've never been before. And we're in a world we've never been in before. And we're dealing with complexity we've never dealt with before. And as our stress goes up and we move more into a reactive state, it becomes harder and harder for us to actually switch off the autopilot, even though that's when we most need to do it. Because as we get stressed, our brains are like, oh, I've got to make things more comfortable. And as that adrenal system becomes activated and we move into this reaction cycle, uh, it's when we most need to slow down and say, okay, wait a minute. I've got to think and feel my way through this situation. I've got to get more data. But it's also when our brains are pushing the hardest, no, just follow the pattern. Go back to what you've done before. And that's where change becomes really difficult, but it's also where the opportunity is. So how do you, how do you fight your brain on that? Uh, wrestle. Uh, it's, it takes a lot of practice. Take that on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like reach in one ear, right? Yeah. It takes a lot of practice. And I think starting in small ways and noticing when we're in that state of reaction, noticing when, uh, when we're on autopilot, it's driven by emotion. When we're in a space of curious learning and engagement, it's also driven by emotion. Tuning in to say, okay, how, what's shaping my reaction right now? And then doing that with others. So and what's the different where, emotion? When you mentioned about the, we're, on a, we're in emotion and both in both autopilot yeah. and not on autopilot, what are the emotions yeah. Emotions. So it, it's not like, I think for a lot of people they are like, oh, well, you know, if we're in fear, then we're going to be an autopilot. And we're if in excitement, we're going to be in, it's not the case. Actually, fear is a great catalyst to get out of autopilot and excitement can put us in autopilot. Uh, it's not that simple. It's not like, oh, they're just they're emotions to avoid and their emotions are going to help us. All emotions are data and all emotions carry energy. They're literally neurobiological nudges that tell us, hey, are you paying attention? It's, it's not what the emotion is, it's how we engage it. And when we're asleep and we're saying, I'm not gonna pay attention to that, we're missing all of this data, we're missing all these clues that are saying, something's happening here. And actually 
it's in the discomfort, it's in the place of challenge and struggle that we probably have the greatest opportunity to engage our emotions. And it's in those places where we're like, I really don't know if I can make it through this. We also feel really alive. That's true. Yeah. That's why we so, learn the most in those, in those valleys of life where there's, there's a struggle when it's going well, most of the time we end up going on autopilot. I was just talking to a client earlier today about that is okay. Everything's going really well. So rather than just go on autopilot and coast is actually checking in with why is it going well right now? And how can I continue to have it go well? And multiply that. And multiply. Yeah. That's yeah. good. So this is why when we look at how organizations actually create value with emotional intelligence, uh, the way I put it is leaders go first. Like that's what it's about. It's about tuning into yourself. It's about growing yourself, growing your capacity, and then building capacity around you. And that's not a workshop. So what is it? And, and I, I, I just imagine some of the leaders, and I've worked with them myself, and both men and women, who are like, you need to fix my people. You need to help them to take more initiative or you need to help them, you know, teach them how to do da, 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 da. And then when it comes to, like you said, leaders go first, they're like, no, I'm fine. Yeah, I don't need to change. They need to change. I am the visionary. How do you, how do you deal with that? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's why the book inside change, why I said like, you, Here, read this you, book. You, no. you, you go first. Um, I just met with the senior leadership team uh, last week about a project we're doing together. And I said, in our work together, I would like us to consider a possibility that what happens in this room becomes the microcosm of what happens in this organization. And the way you're interacting here is the template on which the people around you are gonna be interacting with each other. Your direct reports are gonna interact with their direct reports. And ultimately that's what's gonna be the customer experience. So you have a really clear brand and you have a very clear idea about how you want customers to experience your organization. How do you do that yourselves? And I found that that is a way that I, I think has been helpful for a lot of leaders to say, oh, ultimately there's a, a, a customer involved internal and external customers. And we're trying to have an impact on those customers. And just for example, if we have our, our salespeople are feeling distrust uh, in the organization and they go out and they talk to a customer and the customer says, well, Nicole, are you sure this is going to work? And you're like, mm, yeah, pro probably. It's like, no, I'm not buying from you. <laughs> Right? So it's like a clear case where your emotional experience of your organization and your boss is going to change the value creation. And I would say that's true with investors. It's true with employees. It's true with vendors, true with community partners, true. Uh, it's, it's true with whoever your organization is interacting with. There is an emotional value chain and it starts on the inside. I'd love to shift gears. And I remember when you were talking about this false perception as leaders in terms of what they think leadership is. And you used actually the example of your daughter playing with her dolls or like the John Wayne approach. Can you talk a little bit about that? And yeah, it, it, yeah, I found it really, really fascinating, your perspective on that. So my kid was three years old and playing a school and the bears are lined up and, and I'm saying, you know, nobody bear, you have to raise your hand. And I'm like, wait a minute, this kid has never been in school. How is it that, that they've got this picture of school and they're, they're playing school based on this template? And again, I, I mentioned so often I'll have leaders say to me, you know, well, this is how I'm supposed to show up. I'm like, oh, so are you playing leadership? You know, it's, it's a lot like playing school. It's following the cultural template or our assumption of what that template is. And I think in a lot of organizations, we have this, this picture of leader 
as you said, like John Wayne, this kind of like, you know, tough, stoic, you know, well, okay, that's enough. I'm going to shoot you now. Like it's, there's, it's, it's not this kind of like relational complex. It's not just sent to Arden. And that, and I think that's why, and I, it's, it, I think it's probably deeply rooted in sexism, but I think it's why people are like, well, Jacinta Arden's not strong because she was empathic or she's not strong because she chose to step away. I'm like, that is really strong. And how many, sorry, but how many of us guys as leaders are going to be like, well, I think my work here is done. It's time for me to step away and make room for somebody else. Like that is strong leadership. Yeah. It's a different kind of strength. Yeah. Well, and, you know, we talk about what the, you mentioned about women, for example, that um, even as they go up the, the ladder, the corporate ladder, that they actually, I found that fascinating that they are actually statistically displaying less empathy. Yeah. The higher they go up. And I think, I, I get that in a sense, because even when I started out in business, I mean, if you want to survive in this kind of man's world, you know, mm-hmm. you, you got to take on that persona, right? You got to lean into that. What is considered, I wouldn't say what's masculine, but what is considered masculine mm-hmm. energy. And that's what it takes to succeed. And then we continually perpetuate the problem. And then I see it now, like, you know, oh, we need more women leaders. Yes. And though, if the women are actually going up to the ranks and losing the empathy, then we're not getting the effect of having the female's perspective in that leadership role anymore, because it's now they're just being succumbing. So talk about what leaders are really responsible for and, and maybe even talk a little bit about that, what you've noticed with women uh, leaders and yeah. So this data was pretty uh, disheartening. Um, I um, I'm part of the world's largest study of emotional intelligence. Our data comes from uh, in our last report, 129 countries. It's more than that this year. We're working right now on the new report, and I have some uh, really cool data about about women in leadership uh, coming soon. But um, what we found in the report two years ago is that every for both women, people who identify as female and male, in every aspect of emotional intelligence was correlated with career progression. So in other words, it's part of what helps you get ahead and more emotional intelligence is correlated with a higher position, except for women, senior leaders and empathy. And what we saw is that women um, moving up to manager, empathy is going up and then going from manager to senior manager, it's going down. And I, don't know why, um, but I, my hypothesis is what you said, Nicole, is that there's there's so much cultural pressure to uh, man up, to to be strong, to um, shut off that empathy, and there's some research around emotional labor showing that that women are uh, end up doing more, uh, more coaching, more mentoring, more helping to solve problems more uh, peace building uh, and more checking in. And so I suspect if you're a senior woman leader, that is probably quite exhausting. Yeah. And so how do you cope with that? Well, one way, one popular way is to kind of shut off those feelings, Mm -hmm. but then we lose that value. Yeah. And this is, I think, particularly important as we look at, well, what are we trying, what are we facing right now in organizations? And we, Organizations that have more emotional intelligence, including empathy, they have better retention, they have uh, less costs due to errors, they have more efficiency, they have better solve problem solving. We have a new business case for emotional intelligence coming out. Um, there's so much data. Emotional intelligence is twice as predictive as IQ on business performance. Hmm. And uh, even in a poultry plant that we studied, you know, they're processing chicken. Higher emotional intelligence for managers is more engagement, higher performance in the plant. And so we're talking about a very basic form of competitive advantage. As you deal with increased relational complexity, 
and the demands on your leaders in kind of the people domain goes up, you're going to need more of these skills. And guess what? Look at the world today. We have tremendous relational complexity. And building trust is harder than ever. Managing change is harder than ever. The pace is faster than ever. Turnover is high. You know, business context is as chaotic as it could possibly be. And we're asking leaders to engage and support their people. And they are struggling because they don't have the skills. Yeah. So how do we how do we develop emotional intelligence, the full spectrum of emotional intelligence that we need as leaders? So there's two parts to that story. One is as individuals and the other is looking at organizational systems. So I said, leaders go first. We as leaders need to grow and develop, uh, taking an assessment, getting coaching. Um, it's not enough to go to an hour workshop. I was working with a company uh, recently and they're like, oh yeah, we have, we have a great emotional intelligence program. Oh yeah, tell me about it. Well, we have an, it's an e-learning. It's an hour. It's really popular. Okay. So my research on this is it takes about three to four years of work to really integrate these skills as an individual. And this is countercultural, meaning, again, we have this kind of social conventions about how we think about emotions, how we think about leadership. And if we're going to get away from that, we're going to do very hard work ourselves. But the bigger value creation opportunity, it's, it's not just us as individuals. It's about the culture that we're creating. And so building capacity across the organization and then embedding EQ into our systems and structures and shaping the culture and really being intentional about here's our strategy. Here's how we see value creation in our organization. What is the culture we need to have to support that? And where can we use emotional intelligence to help shape and grow that culture? And that's everywhere from the you know, HR systems and employee life cycle to the way we have our meetings, to the way senior leaders think about what leadership means, to the way their leadership performance is measured. You know, and just for example, uh, we measure trust. And that to me is the number one job of the leader is to grow trust. And if you're not, if you're not measuring trust, how do you know if you're growing it? Yeah. So are you talking about trust internally or externally or both? Both. Both. Yeah. It's interesting you were talking about three to four years because I know so often that's another cultural norm or expectation of, you know, that, that it's the transformation happens quickly. And, you know, we do the, the one hour course or we take the master class. That's very popular these days. Take a master class or, you know, we go to the six week program or we go to a weekend retreat or something like that. And we come out and we're different, you know, we're transformed. But the <laughs> truth is it's not actually transformation. You might have experienced a defining moment. You might've experienced an aha, but I'm, I'm so appreciative of the fact that you actually said that it takes time that's been my experience too in, in my own life and other people's life, that the true transformation, the integration of that so that it's fully integrated and you're actually showing up in a completely different way. It's the caterpillar to the butterfly. It takes time and we need to be willing to take that time. Even leaders looking at their people going, well, I mean, we did a course, we did a few sessions. Why are they not different? You know, why are we all not, you know, completely doing it differently or seeing the results or the performance of the productivity and all this stuff going up. And so, you know, it's, uh, it takes time. And then it's, then there's that investment. It's like, do we want to take that time and invest in doing it? And are we, are we willing to, you know, to, to kind of wait it out? I sometimes feel like organizations are like hemorrhaging blood and saying, I'm not sure if we should invest in band-aids. Like, you know, should we really sew up these wounds? You know, yes, it is an investment, but it is also m businesses are wasting so much yeah. money. Yeah. It's like, why don't we just go get some more blood? Well, you could, but. Right. So people are disengaged. Um, people are distressed as people disconnect from each other and they make more mistakes. They communicate less openly. Um, distress rises. You start having people quiet quitting or, you know, they're starting to check out. And as they start to check out, productivity goes down. 
becomes harder for everybody. It's like there's more friction in the system. As that friction goes up, people are <laughs> dealing with even more stress and distress. And then they make even more mistakes. They communicate less. They become more volatile. And then, you know, you start having very costly errors, uh, damaging your reputation, um, damaging people's lives, damaging communities, you know, having banks fail, like not from some, you know, lack of technical understanding, but because somebody didn't communicate with somebody else. Yeah. It's very expensive. So yes, it is. We could think about it an investment, but I really want leaders to think about this is this isn't, oh, maybe I should invest in my people for the future. Your people are how you make money. Yeah. And just like you would never take a manufacturing machine and say, you know what, we're not going to put oil in this machine. That's an investment. We don't want, we don't have money for en engine oil. Like nobody is ever going to say that. Oh, I hear some grinding. Should we just ignore that? Yeah, don't worry about it. You know, we got to get our productivity up. Turn it, turn it up higher. Like, you know, and the thing sure. blows up. It's like, well, that's what's happening in most organizations is the engines grinding. The gears are, you know, shredding. And we're like, oh, I don't, I don't have time to put oil in the, in the thing. So, yeah. So when you go in and you work with them, do you work with them for that whole period of time to kind of see them through to that? And I know your organization, tell us a little bit about how your organization is set up and how you support mm these leaders, not just with data and books, but, mm -hmm. you know, that consulting going in and actually creating the change or so facilitating my, it maybe is a better way to put it. Yeah. My favorite is when organizational leaders say, okay, we get it. We see that we need skills. We need capacity to build the great culture, help us do it. Um, as I said, there's this kind of capacity building and then embedding and reinforcing. Got it. The first step is actually building the case and making sure it's really clear because very often you'll have some leaders and I've had very senior leaders say, look, I get it, but I'm not sure my people will really be on board with this. I go, Fine. Let's get them on board. Let's get the data. Let's show them what they're wasting and what you could be making if you fix some of this friction. Yeah. All right. So let's get the business case really clear. And then let's map that into your systems and structures. Uh, what, the, what we do at Six Seconds primarily is work to build capacity inside organizations. So maybe that's in your learning development department. Um, if you're a smaller organization, maybe it's uh, shared across your leadership, teaching leaders how to become coaching leaders, teaching leaders how to spread these skills. Um, we can, I think one of the things we often hear is, well, can I actually do things with emotional intelligence or is it just something to be aware of? And I think that a lot of the quote experts out there, they, they're teaching people about emotional intelligence, not necessarily teaching people to use it and embedding it in the way we interact with our employees and our communication and our problem solving that's where we're going to start to see that value creation. So when you mention talking about it versus embedding it in, what would be an example of that? So um, this is a, I don't have permission to talk about this company name, but a very big uh, organization working in highly specialized logistics. And they do a lot of one-to-ones in their, and it's a cultural norm that um, managers will do one-to-ones with their direct reports and they do it. And what one of the managers said to me is, look, I, if I'm really honest, I don't really know what to talk about in the one-to-ones. And so I kind of go like, yeah, okay, how's it going? And, you know, well, great. Let's, you know, let's get a performance up. Let's go. <laughs> And so we worked with them to actually use an emotional intelligence assessment and take their own, what we call brain profile and their direct reports brain profile. It's like, okay, well, let's talk about it. You know, where are we aligned? Where are we different? How does it work? How could we communicate better? How could we communicate better with our customers? And, and in, in, that, in that process, the same manager said, like, I, 
I've heard about emotional intelligence for so many years. Now I, I feel like I can actually go do something in my day to day. Yeah. And so, you know, it could be, that's a relatively sophisticated example, but it could be as simple as let's change the questions that you ask at the start of your meetings. Mm -hmm. Or when you're walking down the hall and you're saying, Hey, how's it going? You're not actually, you're not actually getting good data. Right. Let, Most people don't even wait for data. the answer. I always mess with people and they go, I say, Hey, how's it going? And then they go, hi. And I'm like, how is it going? Like I asked the, you know, I actually wanted, how are you doing? Like I really actually expected an answer, but most people don't even expect that anymore. Yeah. I, uh, I was working with a Sheraton hotel and they had this like slogan that they were, you know, was in studio city, Orlando. And then, you know, welcome to Sheraton studio city, wherever the star, how's it going? Like, and it was like, you couldn't even hear the words. <laughs> it was like, it was just so scripted. It's like, let's stop doing that. Let's stop using the script and actually ask, actually connect with each other. It just literally takes a couple seconds, maybe six. Is that why you called it six seconds? The reason we called it six seconds is that emotions are neurohormones and those neurohormones last in our brains and bodies for about six seconds. What it means is if you believe as, as I do that emotions have value, you have these little six second windows of opportunity to get the value, to tune in and go, oh, there's something happening. There's a message for me here. Hmm. The message about my relationship. There's a message about trust. There's a message about how we're showing up and communicating and engaging. It also means if you want to change what you're feeling, <laughs> it only takes about six seconds to do that. Wow. Well, that's interesting because I know for me, you know, sometimes I've been in an emotional state and it's like, it takes a little longer than six seconds to get out of that. But to think that we can really do it that quickly, it's really the decision and then the follow through on it, the awareness choice and the change. Um, before we finish off, I do want to talk about, I promised at the beginning that we talk about generational EQ differences and how they impact performance. Maybe we can kind of roll that into this because, you know, you're talking about younger generations, things move faster and faster and faster. They, they want it instant yesterday, right? They, they don't watch long videos. They watch short, little, short, short. It's get like, it gets shorter and shorter and faster and faster. Their intention span is shorter and shorter, you know? And I'd be curious to, to hear how that impacts their emotional intelligence and their processing as it relates to this. And like what that means, if you're a leader and you've got all these generations, like how do you manage that? So uh, again, the state of the heart study that we published this year will be coming out again with updated data. In 2018, we, we reported, um, uh, and then in 2021, again, that basically younger people are struggling in the, in the realm of emotional intelligence. And unfortunately, we're seeing this in um, really vivid terms in mental health crisis. The younger you are, the more the pandemic disrupted your life. Um, connection went down across generations, but it went down the most with Gen Z. Um, I think that what I hear from younger people in the workforce is that they are really not interested in playing the same games that people my age have been willing to play. And if a workplace is toxic, um, it's just really not that interesting to them. So I think part of it is for, on the one hand, you know, I think I hear a lot of people my age saying, you know, well, these young people just need to pay their dues. Okay, yeah, that's a legitimate perspective. And maybe we shouldn't have such a toxic environment, you know, and maybe we shouldn't be asking people to do meaningless work. And maybe we shouldn't ask people to be suffering in their workplace. Or maybe we actually should make workplaces that are kind of worthy of human consumption <laughs> and a place that people yeah. actually want to come to work. Yeah. What a thought. Right. And so like meaning and connection and those things are important across the generations. 
and I would say, if we're not doing the work to, to really be clear about why am I asking you to do this? Why are we here? What's the significance of, of this work? It's If it's just shareholder profit, it's just not going to be that motivating to younger generations. Yeah. So obviously, yeah, performance is not going to be there. They're not going to be productive. All of that's not going to happen. It's interesting because, yeah, there's so much flack, you know, about young people and their desire to want to know why and, you know, all this stuff. If they're asking some really good questions, granted, there's also some entitlement and there's other things that are going on, too. But there's some really valid questions that they're asking that we might want to ask ourselves, too. And I know that there's more and more people your age and my age who are asking themselves those questions and saying, what the heck? And you don't have to wait till you're 50 or whatever age, you know, to, to ask yourself those questions. Wow. We could ask ourselves those questions at 20. Think about the impact that we can have. Think about the change that we can, you know, make and the, you know, things that we can do in life, you know? So it's, it's really, really powerful. Is there anything that we didn't cover here? Cause I know you have such a vast knowledge of, of this topic, but as we wrap up, is there anything that we didn't talk about? that is relevant to this in terms of helping people understand how to create that organizational transformation as leaders using intelli- emotional intelligence as a, as a game changer. Yeah. I'd like to kind of wrap up with two key points. One is I said it takes three to four years to really integrate these skills, but it takes very little time to start. And what Good I've point. seen is just a little bit of awareness, a little bit of training, a little bit of coaching, people start to make different choices. They start to engage differently. They need support. They need to sustain that. It takes a while to really get good at it. And I, I, I've been working on this for 25 years and I don't think I'm really good at it, but I'm getting better, <laughs> getting better. And as I'm getting better, uh, I'm able to notice when I've screwed up sooner and correct more easily and so i feel like the you know this sort of course is the course correction get, gets smoother but i don't want you to think oh, i don't have the bandwidth to you know really do this and so i'm not going to do it you can get tremendous benefit from just a little bit of good development on emotional intelligence uh, what we've seen is that in like a two day, and we have a lot of case studies in our on our website. Uh, just like a couple of days of really good uh, program, which is a little different than most training, but something that actually makes it practical for people. Um, we see like a ten percent increase in emotional intelligence scores, and that's correlated with very large improvements in their in performance outcomes. So. It's a long path, but it's easy to get started and you will start to see a difference right away. I love that. Yeah. And then the other point is I just alluded to this stuff is measurable and learnable. We're not talking about something kind of abstract. You don't have to guess. We can graph it. We can graph it for individuals. We can graph it for an organization. We can track it over time and we can see the performance impact. And so you don't have to, you don't have to like, there's no Ouija board involved here. It's like, this is very practical skills that are the difference that makes the difference in, in leadership and people. And if you want to engage people internally and externally, then you're going to grow these skills and you're going to start to get more value from that. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't start, you're not going to be able to finish. So it, mm-hmm. it kind of has to begin somewhere and you start developing these skills and keep, you know, keep, keep it up. I think that's the reinforcing part that you were talking about is embedding them and reinforcing, reinforcing, reinforcing. So those new habits become permanent. So mm-hmm. that's really, really great. And yeah. shifting those cultural norms. And, you know, yeah. we, we built the cultures and we can change them. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, we should, which I don't use that word very often, but I think it's time that we change some cultural norms. It is time. <laughs> Either, either we choose to change them or they will be changed uh, one way or the other. So you can do it. That's kicking the big and lesson screw- of the 2020, <laughs> the, the 2020s, <laughs> right? Yeah. 
you either embrace that and you lead it or you're going to end up doing it, you know, come kicking and screaming, but either way, you know, it's going to happen. So changes, yeah. changes here. Changes here. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Joshua. I appreciate your perspective and the studies and all the things that you've got in terms of resources. So I'm going to encourage our listeners to go to your website, six seconds.org. We'll make sure that's in the show notes. That's six, the number six, six seconds.org. And there's a vast amount of uh, information. And I love the fact that this is measurable. So this isn't like, I think we're improving our emotional you know, intelligence scores. I, I think that our trust is going up or I think, and you know, it's all based on opinion, but this is measurable. And I think that's fascinating that we can measure those things and, and what you measure, you can improve. And so I encourage you to take advantage of what Joshua has available. Leaders of transformation take action and uh, they take intentional action, specific action in a direction moving towards an outcome, a desired outcome. And so I encourage you to not just listen to this and go, oh, that was interesting. Great message. He, you know, he did, he did great. He explained it. And it's, it's cool. But really, how does this apply to our organization? Better yet, how does this apply to me? How can I integrate and apply emotional intelligence today in my next conversation, in my next email that goes out, in the next situation that I'm going to be in and driving home from work? Hello, it requires some emotional intelligence. It's something that we're using all the time. And so learning how to, uh, to do it better just, just helps just helps in every area. So I encourage you to, to do that. I'd love to hear your stories. You can go on leaders of transformation, our website.com. And, um, and you can of course find us on social and, and uh, we'd love to hear how this has impacted you. And if you have any questions, reach out to us. And of course we'll forward them on to Joshua as well, or support you however we can as well. So again, thank you so much for tuning in and we look forward to seeing you on the next episode of leaders of transformation real soon.